We've been talking about PED so much, it's interesting, we haven't talked much about PERS, so it's, it's a different time, isn't it? I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come, and I appreciate uh, Beringer for putting this together. I really want to thank Reed, John Paul, uh, great friends. I want to thank in advance Spencer. You'll see some of Spencer's work, Dr. Spencer Wayne, in the presentation. And I want to thank my University of Minnesota colleagues, Monsi, Bob, Mike, Manny, Kay. Great, 12 great years there. I, I, I loved my time there. It was wonderful. And uh, as Bob mentioned, I've, I've moved on. Just a, a little different challenge. So Pipestone Veterinary Clinic is, uh, has three practices, 24 vets, 14 which focus on pigs. We service the Pipestone system, which is 170,000 sows, over about 40-some family farms. So it's about the fifth largest system in the U.S. So that's just a little background on, uh, on where I've been and what I'm doing now. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, PERS airborne risk and ideas on managing it. And this is, a, this is really a collective summary of ideas and data from our veterinary group that uh, I can't take credit for. This is a team effort. Okay. Really also want to thank CAP2. A lot of the work you'll see in my 30 minutes has been funded by the CAP2. And I think it's going to be hard without CAP. You know, CAP1, when Mike Murtaugh's leadership was a success, CAP2, great success. Bob Rowland, Becky Eaves, and uh, Dr. Z Jeff Zimmerman, who really led our eco-epi group in the CAP2. So a, a lot of acknowledgments and thanks to those individuals on the slide. They did a great job. All right. Oops. Okay. So the topics I'd like to share with you today is, first of all, tell you about a, a study we did at Pipestone looking at the frequency, dose, and diversity of PERS virus airborne challenge to filtered cell farms, which really came up from the veterinary group asking the question, you know, we're investing a lot in air filtration and preventative means to, to reduce the airborne risk, but is it real? How often does it happen? What type of challenge are our farms experiencing on a daily basis? So I'll share some of that with you. That's still work in progress. And then talk about some intervention strategies to reduce airborne risk, specifically in our practice, uh, we filter the sow farm and we vaccinate the wean to finish population. And that's a very simple answer to that, what are we going to do about it, but I'll explain why we do that. And then we'll just conclude. Okay, so let's get right into it. Topic number one, this is a study, uh, again, CAP2 funded. The objective of this study was to evaluate the frequency, dose, and diversity of PERS virus airborne challenge around filtered sow farms. And our hypothesis was that PERS virus airborne risk is real and significant. So the methods, we selected four PERS virus negative filtered farms. They were in four different geographical regions within our practice. One farm was in northwest Iowa in a very swine dense region. Another in eastern Iowa by our Independence Iowa Clinic. In southwest Minnesota right by Pipestone proper. And then just across the border in eastern South Dakota. The period we sampled was October 15th to December 15th of last year. And basically every day we took an air sample, I'll explain, from 7 to 7.30 a.m. using a cyclonic collector, uh, basically placed in the direction of the prevailing wind outside of the farm, approximately 30 meters from the building. So we're looking at perimeter challenge, not what's coming out of the farm, because remember these were negative farms, but what's around this area. And then we're going to collect our samples. We're going to test them by three assays, PCR, to look for the number of PERS virus positive air days, the frequency of challenge. Then we're going to titrate to see if we could identify viable virus in the sample and quantify it. And then if we had any uh, positives along those lines, we're going to try to sequence. And because we had the CAP funding, we could sequence ad libitum. So we were going to really go for it and do a lot of sequencing work. There we go. We had a number of controls in this study. First of all, we used trained people. We went, people went through a training protocol, how to collect the sample, how to run the machinery. Uh, we piloted the protocol in March of 2012, so we had some experience. 
We use published protocols for air collection that uh, Andrew Pitkin and I had developed back when I was at the University of Minnesota. Also, sanitation protocols for air collectors. Again, how do we properly clean these so they, uh, they aren't contaminated? Every, any material that went out to a farm or came back from a farm was sampled to be sure that there wasn't uh, contamination involved in, in shipment. And then any positive samples we were going to sample by PCR, we'll repeat PCR uh, testing. We'll do some sequencing uh, to repeat the sequencing in certain cases to be sure that was accurate. And then to, just to be sure there's no contamination, we're going to test the samples by ELISA as well. And then finally, we're going to collect some air at a PERS virus negative, actually a pig-free site uh, during the trial period, 10 samples per month, just to show that our methods themselves are not generating false positives. So here's a picture. You, some of you have seen this before. This is just a liquid cyclonic collector uh, produced by Rural Technologies Incorporated and Midwest Microtech in Brookings, South Dakota. Uh, air is pulled up through the base of the collection vessel. They're sailing in the, in, the, in the vessel. It's spinning a rotor, washing the air, and the particles from the air are then trapped in the liquid, and those particles and that sample of liquid sailing are sent to the uh, diagnostic lab. Just to get right into the results, this is the frequency of PCR positive air days throughout the 60 day sampling period. So we had 217 total samples, 80 were PCR positive. And you can see how they broke down by farm. The Northwest Iowa farm, the Eastern South Dakota, Southwest Minnesota, and Eastern Iowa. So you can see we were able to find PERS virus RNA in the air around these farms uh, anywhere from 29 to 42% of the time. Then we sent the samples in for virus titration. And so this is growth of virus in, on cells, not uh, quantitative PCR. This is, these are actually TCID50 data. And we've got the four farms at the bottom on the x-axis. We've got the log virus concentration on the y-axis, log transform TCID50 data, just showing you the uh, mean quantity of virus across the samples from each sampling site. So if you go up to the far corner in the upper left-hand corner, you see uh, 5.3. So that's the Northwest Iowa farm. There was an average of uh, roughly 10 to the 5 uh, TCID50 uh, in those samples. And you see the 95% confidence intervals surrounding the mean. And you can see that that particular set of samples was significantly different than what we found on the other farms. So we're able to quantify that there is viable virus in these air samples and to approximate how much. Then we get into diversity, and this is where it gets tricky, and this is work in progress, and I give Spencer a great deal of credit. Uh, this is Spencer's, a lot of this is Spencer's work, and we're still analyzing this now, but I want to show you some new ways we're looking at uh, the sequences, because we had 80 positive samples, and because of the cap, we had the funding to sequence, so we sequenced every one. I saw some interesting things. So let's look at the diversity within the sample set as it compares to our practice dendrogram, first of all. Then within the data set itself, what does it look like within, its, within the 80 samples? And then let's look at it on an area basis, one particular sampling area just for, for uh, an example. And then let's look at some interesting long distance relationships, which we're still trying to tease out what they really mean. So we'll get into some, uh, some slides here that I'd like to take some time and really try to explain them. Our Pipestone dendrogram is approximately 3,000 sequences, and this is just another one of the great skills that Spencer brings. So every time we sequence a sample, it goes into a database. And basically, this slide shows you all the black in the back. That's the entire practice dendrogram. Okay, so roughly 3,000 viruses have been sequenced and cataloged in this data set. If you can see the little pieces of orange here and there, those are the air samples. Those are the 80 air samples, just to show you basically kind of where they fell throughout the whole practice dendrogram. It shows up pretty good, but you can see that it's, it's quite spread out. It's not a particular area of localization. There, you can see the, the orange sequences throughout the entire Dendrogram. So this is like the 30,000 foot view of where these samples fell within our entire practice dendrogram. Now 
Now let's look at these samples let's in, in a couple different ways. Let's look at the, the air samples which had 100% uh, homology or similarity to samples within that 3,000 denogram, denogram. And basically what we see is if we look at, there's, there were 12 unique viruses. So 12 viruses within, or 12 sequences within that 80 air sample set that didn't match anything in the 3,000 uh, practice dendrogram. So at the top of the, the slide up there, you see matches zero total 12. So there were 12 sequences from these, this 80 sample set that did not match any previous historical sequences within our roughly a 10-year uh, compilation of sequences. On the other side, we saw all the way down to the bottom, there were, I think, seven, as it says, where there were over 100 matches from the dendrogram historically. So we had both sides of the spectrum, certain sequences which didn't match anything, and then some sequences which had many, many, many matches within that 3,000 sequence set. Some of these unique viruses, or these 12 viruses that didn't match anything, were confusing. Um, see, you know, typically these sequences which lacked a match demonstrated conflicts at, the, at the, what the laboratory would report back. And conflicts were defined by ambiguous bases and are nucleotide deletions in their respective trace files. And the laboratory personnel would share but possibly this could indicate multiple viruses were present in the sample or potentially some genetic change going on within that virus. When you looked at those trace files from these 12 unique sequences, you'd see very weird um, things like this, where you have your, here's your trace file, and you, instead of nice, clean A, T, C, and G, you see a number, in this case, of multiple ambiguous bases, and the interpretation from the laboratory suggestive of multiple strains. And a number of these, just for, as a comment, came from that northwest Iowa sampling area, which I should reference has about 80,000 finishing pigs within a three-mile radius. So very, very dense with multiple ownership changes over time. So there were some really strange sequences in, in this data set. Now, let's look at the data set itself. Let's take the 80 sequences from the air and take them one by one and spread them out. And so that's the x-axis. Each of those little bars is an individual sequence across the 80. So those are the air samples on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we've got the number of matches that each of those individuals correlated to in the entire practice data set. So first of all, what you see are two groups, one in blue, one in, and one in red. The blue were the, the viruses which looked most likely, most like the, the modified live vaccines. And they're highlighted, 142 ATP, 252 MLV. You can see there were many, many matches in the practice dendrogram which correlated with vaccine. Not surprising, we, we use a lot of vaccine in our practice. But then if you look at the red, the individual red bars, Basically, it's a little hard to see up here, but I'll show you next slide. There's a lot of 1182s, first of all. You can see some of those first clusters of red bars you see. If you can read, they're 1182s, get into 126.2s, you know, and down you go. And, and as you see that the, uh, the red number is decreasing, you see how those samples, basically, how those sequences compared in frequency when compared to the overall practice dendrogram, okay? So if you do it a little differently, this time take the vaccine out and just look at the wild types and, and group them by RFLP. This makes it a little easier to understand kind of where these wild type viruses fell in relationship to each other. So we've got a lot of 1182s. First of all, you can see within the air sample set on the x-axis, and again, compared to the, the sequence practice dendrogram on the, uh, on the y. 1182s, 126.2s were next, then came some 122s, 144s, some 142s which weren't vaccine, uh, 184s, and down the line we go. 
And you can see as we get smaller and smaller and smaller, those are the individuals at the far end that didn't match anything. So there were, say, one sequence that didn't match anything in the dendrogram. It was just one by itself. So there's quite a bit of diversity within the air sample database by itself. Okay, now if you look at it at an area basis, let's just take the Northwest Iowa sampling area and, and look at the diversity within that area. And so the x-axis is sampling days. We started in October and went through December. The y-axis is percent relative humidity. That's that wavy line. I was trying to see if there was some relationship to collecting viruses in air according to relative humidity. So don't let that um, bother you too much here. But what, what I want to show is a number of, of viruses here uh, highlighted in red. Um, these were the, the viruses, the sequences that we'd, we'd seen before. The ones in black we had not seen before, and the blue were some vaccine. So within this area, you can see there were quite, there's quite a bit of sampling diversity or sequence diversity in this area. So you can see a virus a, uh, 144, there's 134s, 122s, 126.4s. These are all different viruses. So there's a lot right around this Northwest Iowa farm, there were many positive samples as well as uh, a great diversity of viruses. And so you see there's also some letters in each of those little boxes. And what I'd like to do is try to show you the relationship now of finding the virus in air and then finding it later in farms. So I call this long distance relationships and this is by no means proof that this is the same virus. Of course we can't say that because we're only looking at OR5 but it's an inter some interesting observations, and I'll just take you through a little bit of this chart to show you uh, what we're trying to work on now. We don't have this really well figured out. This is just a very, very uh, broad-based view. But if we look at the first line, the first column, we got per the, there's the PERS viruses. There's uh, uh, eight of them in this, in this summary, I believe. 144A. Um, that virus was found in an infected farm in western South Dakota. Okay, on November 6th, all right? But when we went back and looked at our air samples, we found that virus in the air around the Northwest Iowa farm on October 15th, okay? And there was 170 miles between those two sites, just for point of reference, and there's about a 99% similarity between or five. And that's a story you see as you go down this table you see a virus which we found in pigs, typically in a remote area, on a date which was later than we found it in air. 1443, affected farm B, again in western South Dakota, in pigs November 11th. October 18th, we found that virus around, again, the northwest Iowa sampling area. A long distance between, and again, very similar uh, or five when compared the two. When you look at it in another way is relationship across air sampling sites. So let's take the virus 144 at the top again. We found that virus in the air around the northwest Iowa sampling area on October 16th. We found another 144 around the southwest Minnesota air sampling area on October 19th. And then we found another 144 in the eastern Iowa on October 21st. And we compare those three sequences and they're 100% the same. So again, no proof that it's the same virus, but it's interesting kind of the temporal progression of collection in air around one site, movement to a second site, and then collection again of a very similar virus in a third site. So that's, a, that's another way we're trying to get our arms around what does this all mean. It's still work in progress. We can't really draw many conclusions, but um, it's kind of interesting. Okay, results. As far as our controls go, things came back good. All of our uh, controls checked out. All of our materials were uh, no evidence of contamination. We validated our positive samples as best we could. Um, we, we, PC, we tested everything again by PCR, it basically came back the same. Uh, we re-sequenced re a number of samples, we confirmed they were the same sequence. 
And again, everything came back on ELISA as a negative sample. And then no positive samples were detected in my pig-free site during the trial period. So our methods themselves were not generating false positives. So from this first study, we felt as veterinarians from our clinic that the, the, under the conditions that we, we undertook this study, that the airborne risk was real, that farms experienced a high frequency of airborne challenge, the quantity of viable virus in air was high, Diversity was significant at several levels, and similar sequences, for what it means, were detected in air samples and pig samples over long distances at different points in time. So what do we do about it? Well, now that we had confirmed, at least within our group, that this is something we have to deal with, now it's time to take some, take some steps of action. And as I mentioned, there's basically two in our system, in our, in our system as well as our clinic, is we filter the south farm and we vaccinate the wean to finish. And I'll show you why we do that. This is a paper we published last year showing you the effect of air filtration before and after, basically. So we had a, a data set of 24 sow farms that had special criteria for selection and inclusion in the study, and three cohorts, three and a half year, two and a half year, and one and a half year pre and post filtration. So the, the left-hand side of the graph is pre-filtration, the right-hand side of the graph is post-filtration. Each black diamond is a new virus. And so you can see the effect that filtering these farms had on reducing new infections. Clearly not 100%, that's for sure. We know that's the case. It's not a perfect system, but it's a significant reduction in the number of new infections that this data set had experienced before and after filtering. So this drives our system now. Of the 170,000 sows, there's approximately 90 to 100,000 which are under filtration. And as we build new farms, independent of location, they are built with filters. And what this does is help significantly reduce the, co reduce the cost. So instead of 250 US dollars for a retrofit, we're down to about $130 now in new construction per sow. And some of that's new construction, but some of that's also our partnership with 3M. So we've got, we've are able to get these filters at a cheaper price, which is something we've always wanted to do. So $135 a sow, if you amortize that over a 10 year period with filter cost, with replacement, with installation, with operation maintenance, uh, you got about $1.30 to $1.36 a pig in costs to filter a barn now. The installation is $7.50 to $15 to put a filter in we understand the operating costs as well. About 36 to $37 uh, per year to filter. So we've got this cranked down pretty tight versus what it used to be before. So getting better all the time. The second thing we'll do is we'll vaccinate the wean to finish flow. And the rationale for doing that really came from a question that our vet group asked a number of years ago. But is it beneficial to vaccinate wean to finish populations for PERS to reduce or the risk to area sow farms? Looking at our sow farms with the goal of producing PERS virus negative pigs for shareholders, what can we do to reduce the challenge of the neighborhood? And then we've really looked at, uh, just in this, at this case, we've just looked at the Behringer modified live vaccine, and we've done this within our pipestone facilities. We've, and really, there's two, we've taken two approaches. One is more of a therapeutic approach where the population is already infected, and we're going to come in and vaccinate. What does that do for reducing the risk of external virus shedding from the farm to the neighborhood? Which really came from some of John Paul's work and also Daniel and Harris with his, his, his thesis, both which have been published in vaccine. And then let's look at it the other way. Let's look at it more as a prophylactic approach where we vaccinate the pigs ahead of time and see what happens when they get infected. So I'll just take you through the, I'll take you through the, uh, the two slides, very, the two studies very quickly. The therapeutic approach, basically in our facility, we've got uh, 2,400 head wean to finish barns. We split those building in two. We've got separate pits, separate rooms, separate attic, roughly 1,000 pigs on each side. Uh, in this case, we wanted to infect first, vaccinate second. So we infected 10% of the population with a 118.2 virus on both sides. The control side got a placebo. 
the vaccine side got two doses of ATP, roughly 30 days apart, seven days after infection. And this is kind of what it looks like, you know, when we looked at the uh, air sampling results, we were collecting air every day on the outside of the facility, again using the cyclonic collector. You can see that we had a difference in the number of positive air days on either side of the building. So the control group, there were more, a significantly higher number of positive air days in regards to exhaust air, 31 out of 120 versus 17 out of 120. And then the duration of shedding. The control group shed, the population shed for a longer period of time. The vaccine group for a significantly less period of time. If we do this again, but we vaccinate first and infect second, same setup basically, 1,000 pigs per side, well, vaccine group gets 1x uh, MLV, placebo gets saline, we challenge four weeks post-vaccination again with the 118.2 and collect air. We saw some interesting results in regards to, the, again, the number of positive air days was significantly less in the vaccine group, 21 to 5, and the duration of shedding within the population was significantly less in the uh, vaccine group, 36 days versus 6 days. So prophylactic vaccination really, really worked at reducing the, uh, the airborne risk of excretion of virus to the neighborhood. But we also, what we also saw was a performance benefit. We also measured these animals all the way through market. The portion of pigs culled was significantly lower in the vaccinated group than the non-vaccinates, and the average daily gain was significantly higher in the vaccinates than the non-vaccinates. So we had a performance benefit too, which was really nice. Uh, not only are we going to help the neighborhood, but we're also going to help the producer. And last slide, overall conclusions. From these studies, we've concluded that the frequency, dose, and diversity of PERS virus airborne challenge is significant in swine dense regions. Interventions to reduce this risk include air filtration and vaccination. Both are highly effective. And in this case, we can only speak for the BIMLV vaccine, but it was advantageous for reducing PERS virus airborne shedding and improving performance in the weaned to finished populations. Thank you.